You may be seated. I'm going to ask you today, participation is huge because you're going to learn something. It's going to be hit in your heart. We don't have fill in the blanks because this is too important. It's not something that we want you to have written on a page. It's something we want you to have written on your heart. Last week, we told you that we would be talking today about how to live above the circumstances. Let me talk about a man right now who was a, a mentor in my life, a guy who discipled me. His name was Ron, and Ron Lackey um, had severe diabetes. He ate right he prayed he believed God he was an awesome guy but he still lost fingers and toes and ultimately a leg he was in the hospital for the amputation of the second leg being taken off a friend of mine went to visit Ron and when he got to him in the hospital he said Ron was sitting up in bed with this big smile on his face and he was like come on in you know and the guy said Ron what's going on what are you doing and Ron said I'm rewriting my testimony to include my second leg and the guy said, what is this? Have you ever known somebody that they seem to, seem to live in this place that regardless of what was happening around them, regardless of the circumstances that they were in, they still had joy and they still had peace. you ever seen that in somebody? Have you ever wondered, how do you get that? And I want to tell you, you don't get that by going to seminary, all right? And in fact, a, a seminary professor, his name is Howard Hendricks, um, talked about the fact, he said, I would walk across the campus and see one of my students and say, well, how are you doing today, John? And he said, their answer would be something like, well, Professor Hendricks, under the circumstances, I guess it, I'm doing, doing okay. And, and so Professor Hendricks' response to that would be to say, under the circumstances? What are you doing under the circumstances? You're a follower of Jesus. You're not under the circumstances. The circumstances are under you, Right? Who would like to know how to live above the circumstances, right? We're going to find the answer to that. Paul wrote to the Philippians and told that he had discovered it. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, where he says this. He says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He had learned that secret. And we're going to see where that secret was actually implemented in the city of Philippi, the people he would later write to in the book of Acts chapter 16. Grab your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 16, and turn over, and we're going to start reading in verse 16 of Acts chapter 16. I'm going to tell you, set a little bit of context for what's happening before you get to that verse, Acts 16, verse 16. So first of all, I just want to ask you the question, what are the circumstances that cause you to lose your joy? What are the circumstances that cause you to lose your peace? How about when there's conflict between you and people you love? Does that cause you to lose your joy and lose your peace? That was the case for Paul and Silas. Paul's best friend, Barnabas, he and his best friend had had such a sharp disagreement, they had parted company. He knew what it was to be in conflict, and yet we're going to still, he still knew how to have joy and have peace. How many people here, when you get really, really exhausted and tired, you tend to lose your joy and lose your peace? Anybody besides me? These guys had just been traveling about a thousand miles before they got to this city where they were in Philippi, and they had been trying to seek God's will and, and not been able to do things they thought were the things they should do, and finally they've landed here in Philippi. They were exhausted, no doubt, and yet still they had joy and they had peace when you see them in this beautiful place. How about this? How many people find that when there's frustrations and irritations, you lose your joy and you lose your peace? You ever lose it because of frustrations and irritations? Well, here's what we have in verse 16. We find out that while they were on their way to a place of prayer, that there was a, a girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future, and her owners earned a lot of money because of her ability to predict the future. In verse 17, it says that she traveled along behind Paul and Silas and the others, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they're telling you how to be saved. And she just kept it up. These men are servants of the Most High God telling you how to be saved. She kept it up for days. And finally it says that Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And it says that immediately the Spirit left, right? Well, in verse 19 you find out what happens next. 
The people who owned her, once they realized that their hope of earning money from her was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to make them face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates. And they said, these men are Jews, and they're throwing our whole city into an uproar by advocating customs that we as Romans cannot accept or practice. And so what happens next in verse 22, it starts to go up a notch. But before it goes up a notch, I just want to ask, have you ever been in a place where you've been falsely accused or where people have been against you or where, whether it's your boss or your teacher or your parent or somebody is wrongly treating you, does it take away your joy? Does it take away your peace? Well, that's where they would have been, but yet they still, you will see, will have joy and peace. Well, then it ramps up in verse 22. It says that the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And it says that the magistrates ordered that they be stripped and beaten. Now it went to pain and suffering. you got to understand that they were beaten with rods is what the magistrates ordered. Stripped, naked, and beaten with rods. Do you know that according to historical accounts, many people died just during the process of this beating. It was so severe. And it says in verse 23 that after they were severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. How many people here, when you suffer, you lose your joy and you lose your peace? When your body is racked with pain or when you're going through a struggle, how hard is it to maintain joy and peace in those circumstances? Very difficult, right? These guys are in extreme pain at this point. Now it takes it up a notch as we go into the last part of verse 23. It says they were thrown into prison and the jailer was, was commanded to guard them carefully when he received the order it says that he put them into the inner cell and fastened their seat um, their feet in stocks imagine your feet fastened in stocks in the inner cell of a rat rat nasty prison and now you've lost your freedom and everything's been taken away from you how many people when things start getting taken away from you and things that you thought you should have i've lost my home i've lost my car i've lost you know i've got things that are i've maybe lost my marriage i've maybe lost things that i shouldn't have lost and i've lost my freedom i mean you might be a kid that's on restriction and it really wasn't your fault it was your brother's fault and you're just like you're losing you know i'm losing my freedom and it's being taken from me and you're in those places, how many people know that it's really hard when things are being taken away from you and you've lost your freedom and those difficult times are coming. It's hard to have joy and it's hard to have peace, and yet these guys do. And so now here's what we're going to learn. In verse 25, you can underline this verse because it's where everything changes. It's where you begin to see the secret. This is where the secret is revealed. It says that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Now listen, when it says singing hymns to God, it's not like, like laments, like oh, sad hymns. This, these, this word, the Greek word, actually has the connotation of, of songs of joy, of praise to God and thanksgiving to God. Joyful kind of celebration coming out of these songs. These guys are singing praise to God, and they're praying, and the other prisoners are listening. In verse 26, it says that that suddenly such a great earthquake occurred that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, all the doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. Now, I just want to note this to you, and I want you to remember it, and so we're going to do it together. Are you ready? I just... I want you to remember this. This passage teaches us that when we praise God, He lifts us above the circumstances. So I I know this may not be your practice, but you'll remember it by this if you don't mind. I'd like you to just kind of free up your hands. How many people just stick your hands in the air and just think, this is praising God. When I praise God, He lifts me above the circumstances. Can you all remember above the circumstances, right? So when I praise God, He lifts me above. All right, that was almost good. You ready? When I praise God, He lifts me above the circumstances. Right? He does, and that's His desire for us. And here's how and why He does it. Do you realize that these guys, even while their feet are in the stocks, when they begin to praise God, what God does for them is bring to mind the most crucial truths that they must have and they must never doubt, and that is that He is on the throne and His plans for them are good. I'm going to get your help. This is the dividing line right here, all right? He is on the throne. Can you all remember throne? He is on the throne. All right. His plans for me are good. Can you remember good? Right? His plans for me are good. 
He is on the, his plans for me are. And that, those two truths, I want you to understand that Paul knew these two truths through Psalm 62, 11, and 12. They're verses that many people have memorized because it says this, One thing God has spoken, two things have I heard, that you, O God, are strong and that you, O Lord, are loving. Surely you will reward each person according to what they have done. Do you know that those two core truths are the truths that you must never doubt because when you start to doubt either of those truths, you will lose your peace and you will lose your joy. If you begin to think for a moment that God is no longer in control, if you think that wicked people or bad circumstances or other things have somehow taken over and God is not on the throne, he's not in control over things within my life, you will begin to lose your peace and you'll begin to lose your joy. But if you realize that no matter what any human being on the planet does, God is still on the throne. He's still in charge. He's still over everything. Then you can have joy, right? And you can have peace in the midst of that. But you must never doubt that he's on the throne. But if you think he's on the throne and you doubt for a second that he is good. Like if you think he's on the throne, he's in control, but he just doesn't like me. He's just wanting to mess up me. He doesn't have good plans for me. His intentions for me aren't good. Then you're in trouble, agreed? Because what's going to happen is you're going to lose your joy and you're going to lose your peace. So i got to remember not only that God is on the but his plans for me are right. i got to know that. And if I begin to doubt that, believe me, I'll lose my peace and I'll lose my joy. I need to remember that deeply within my heart. And so Paul wrote to the Romans his discovery of this truth, his restatement of this truth, I guess, in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, when he said very simply, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know what he was saying? Watch this. He was saying this. He was saying, look, he had just got finished saying we live in a world with all kinds of trouble and all kinds of pain and all kinds of difficulties. Even creation is groaning right now, just waiting for Jesus to come back and make things right. And in the midst of that circumstance, he says, but we know that in all things... In all things, regardless of what's happening around me, in all things, God's at work, right? He's still on the throne for the good of those who love him. He is good, and his plans for me are good. Can you see the power of those words for Paul? And that's the reason Paul was able to write to these Philippians in chapter 4, verse 4, before he says, I've learned the secret, he says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. And guess what? The dude is in prison or at least house arrest when he writes this. And he's going, don't you get it, guys? You need to be rejoicing in him all the time because when you praise him, he lifts you above the circumstances, right? Y'all ready? Come on. When you praise him, lift up those hands. He takes you above the circumstances. He does every time. And he reminds you that he's on the... And his plans for you are, right? And so that's what happens that that led Paul to actually write to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. He said, you be joyful always, you pray continually, you give thanks in all circumstances. Because if you will praise him, he will lift you where? Above the circumstances. I've just got to do that, guys. And so you praise him in all circumstances, you thank him all the time, because that is essential to you having joy and peace And so I want to ask you a question. Do you understand what it would be like and what a difference it would make in your life if you were to just practice that one thing? I don't praise him after the chains come off. Y'all remember they praise God first, then the chains came off. They praise God right in the middle of the circumstances, knowing that right here in the middle of the circumstances, That he's on the throne and his plans for me are good, right? And they're praising him, allow God to lift them above the circumstances. And that's what he's going to do in your life. That's what he did in Ron's life. The reason that Ron was praising God was not because God had answered prayer and he kept his leg. He was praising God because in the midst of the circumstances, he knew God was on the throne and his plans for him were good. And as he praised God, God was lifting him above the circumstances. 
And that is a choice for you to make to praise him. So listen, if you're a person who's had conflict, how many people here are having conflict between you and somebody you love? God's just saying right now, you just go ahead and praise him. Because if you'll praise him, he'll lift you above the circumstances. He'll remind you that even while you're in this conflict, he's still on the throne. His plans are still good. How many people here in a place where you are like feeling so much exhaustion and frustration? I mean, just imagine yourself in that place where you've been wrongly accused or bad things have happened in your life. You're on your way home from work where you've just been either fired or, or disciplined and it wasn't your fault or, or you've left school and somebody's done unfair things and treated you wrongly and you're in traffic on 501 and it's backed up and you're just feeling so frustrated and so angry and you're on your way home to a wife who's mad at you for no good reason. You've been good, right? Or you're on your way home to a parent who's got you in trouble when you really didn't do it. You know what I'm talking about. And you're in frustration and you're in exasperation. If you can just pause for a minute and say, God, I praise you. I praise you because you are still on the throne right now. You're still on the throne right now, regardless of what's happening. And your plans for me are good. And you're going to work this together, even this for my good. And so, God, I want to praise you. And he'll lift you above those circumstances. And, guys, if that was, if that was all, it would be enough, right? But it's even more beautiful than that. Look at verse 27. When you get to verse 27, it says that after they praise and the chains come off, it says that the Philippian jailer, when he woke up and saw that the doors were open, he drew his sword to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. As a Roman soldier, he would have been put to death horrifically for letting the prisoners escape. So he thought, I'll die a more peaceful death by putting myself to death. And what happens in verse 28? Y'all reading verse 28? It says that Paul yelled out and said, don't do it. Stop. We're all still here. Do you understand the significance of that? Do you understand what that means was happening for Paul when he was praising God? Is he realized something. He realized, I'm on a mission for God. I am on a mission for God. The fact that he turned his attention to God reminded him, wait a minute, I'm fulfilling a purpose here. I've got a mission for God. So the good work that God said he would do when he works everything together for the good of those who love him, the next verse that Paul wrote said, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. What Paul realized is, look, God's good work in me is not to give me a a carefree, pain-free, dilly-dally life through this world. He didn't intend to give me a paradise on earth. He brought me into a mission. And the good work he does in me is not my comfort, it is my character. The good work he does in me is to make me like his son, and his son suffered plenty, right? His son went through a whole lot, but his son lived, man. He lived life to the full, and God is saying, that's the good I want to bring in you. And so Paul's sitting there realizing, wait a minute, this prison cell is not incongruent with the fact that God has me on a mission and I am here for a purpose and I'm not even going to leave. Even though the chains have fallen off and the doors are open, I'm staying because i got a purpose. How about if you just knew that whenever you're going through, whatever you're going through, if you know God's got a purpose, if you know he's got a mission for you, then it gives you courage and it gives you strength and it gives you joy and it gives you peace, right? Right? And so God is saying, don't you get it? Don't you get it? Not only am I on the throne of my plans for your good, but you are on a mission for him. All right? So I want some help with this, right? All right? Can y'all remember? I am on a mission. Can we do it again? I am on a mission. Right. I'm on a mission. I've got a purpose here And so Paul understood that God had him on a mission. Ananias had been told right after Paul was saved. Paul was saved from hell. He was deserving of hell just like you and I deserve hell. And God had snatched him up and loved him just like he loves every person in this room. and said, I love you. I want a relationship with you, Paul. But as soon as he saved Paul from hell and death, he said, I've got a purpose for this man. Do you understand that as soon as God saves you from hell and death, he's got a purpose for you? Otherwise, he could take you straight to heaven, right? As soon as he saved you, he could just take you straight to heaven and it'd be done. The only reason you're left here is there is a purpose for you, as there was for Paul. So Ananias, the man who spoke to Paul right after God saved him from from hell and death, Ananias was told to go and talk to Paul. 
And here's what God said to Ananias in, in Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16. He said, this man is my chosen instrument to carry or proclaim my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. He's got a purpose. And then he says in verse 16, I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. Wow. You see, Paul wasn't deceived into believing that somehow I should be expecting that everything's going to go easy and breezy for me. He wasn't expecting that somehow God wanted to provide paradise for him. It was no, it wasn't my comfort that he was working for. It was my character he's working for. And it's my mission and my purpose to be fulfilled. That's what God is doing. And that changed everything for Paul. Changed it enough that he didn't even leave the prison cell. Is that the coolest thing ever? I'm still there, right? Right? So listen to this. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? God is on the, and his plans for me are, you guys didn't do real good in here. God is on the, and his plans for me are, right? But I am on a, I'm on a mission, man. That changes so much when you realize that you're on a mission that God has given you. And so watch what happened on that mission in verse 29. It says that the Philippian jailer called for the lights, and, he, and he, he went into Paul and Silas trembling. It says that he brought them out in verse 30, and he said, what must I do to be saved? And in verse 31, they answered by saying, believe in Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your whole family, right? Is that the coolest thing ever? And then in verse 32, it says that they spoke the word of God to him and to everyone else in his household. And so they're all hearing that, man, all of a sudden, Paul and Silas are going, this was our purpose. Now I understand jail. I didn't understand jail. I didn't understand the beating. didn't understand the bleeding. didn't understand. But now look what God is doing. He's doing something profoundly powerful, and he did and so it says in verse 33 that the jailer actually was, was washing their wounds. And y'all remember, they are split open. They are bleeding and broken. And yet at the same time, they are fulfilling a mission and loving these people who are around them. And as he's washing their wounds, you can just imagine this is so beautiful. As he's washing them physically, they must have started talking about him being washed spiritually. Because it says immediately he and all those of his household were baptized. All of a sudden, it's like, man, you think that this kind of washing, wait until your sins are washed away, man. Wait until you are saved from hell and death. Wait until you step into relationship with Jesus. And they're all baptized and they're washed. And so it says in verse 34 that he brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And and then it says this, that he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household Imagine what it's like for Paul and Silas to realize, man, God is with us. He's on the throne, right? He's on the throne, and his plans are good, and we're on a mission, and look what God's doing through the mission. That's what it was like for my my friend Ron. After Ron got healed up from his second amputation, we were at a youth retreat called Chrysalis. Some of you, who's been on Chrysalis? Anybody raise your hand? Awesome. Some of you guys are on the board of Chrysalis. Wonderful. Bunch of young men on this retreat, and, and some of the speakers there were like, you know, big hoss athlete kind of guys and, and all this stuff, and so you're expecting that's what would make a difference in the life of a youth. But in comes Ron, and, um, and Ron Lackey is walking on two prosthetic limbs and one of the guys is having to hold his finger in Ron's belt loop on the back of his pants to keep him from falling down and to help him make his way. And he makes his way, hobbling ultimately up to the pulpit area and grabs the pulpit by both sides. And he begins to speak to those boys, and that's over 30 years ago. And there are young men who love Jesus today and whose lives are forever changed because of what Ron stood standing there And I remember Ron telling me one time, he said, Jeff, I believe for all of us there's a great humbling. He said, I believe we will go through things that we don't understand, and I believe we'll go through suffering and difficulties. He said, but he's working everything for the good of fulfilling the mission that he's given us, right? And then Ron Ron told me, he said, he said, I believe that that great humbling is what God brings us through to do his greatest work in us. And so later he told me, he said that he had been asked to speak at Promise Keepers where thousands of men gather together and lives are touched and lives are radically altered by by what God does there. And 
God was doing it in Iran. Do y'all get the picture? He was on a mission. And you guys, if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, and this is so beautiful, the last truth, the thing that they realize, you only see by going back to verse 28. So you'll go back to verse 28, and I want you to notice something you might not have noticed. It's so cool. He said, don't kill yourself, jailer, because we are... No, not here. Y'all read it. Because we are... Yeah, do it again. We are... We are all here. It's like, what? It isn't just Paul and Silas hanging around. Everybody's still there. They're praying and singing hymns to God, and they are praising God, and the other prisoners are listening after the foundations are shaken and the doors fly open and the chains fall off. The other prisoners are still there. Why? Anybody got an idea? It's pretty clear. God was there. He was there. When you begin to praise God, you realize the truth that He is with you. And if you are in the presence of God, that's where you want to stay. Agreed? That's where you want to be. And the reality that God was with them is why they stayed. The reality that God was with them is what came to Paul and Silas as they're praising God. They're realizing, you are here, and you are with me, and I have every reason for joy. I have every reason for peace because you're here. He is always with me. How many people can just remember with me over here? Can you all do that? He is always with me. Right, right. I am on a... And he is always, picture that. Imagine how radically that changes your life. Paul actually wrote in Philippians 4, 4 that we read earlier where, where we said that he said, I, I want you to praise God all the time. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. The next verse, verse 5, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. He was actually living that out in that Philippian jail, man. He's like, everybody, everybody could feel the peace. Everybody could feel the joy. Everybody could see our gentleness because the Lord was near, right? And guys, come on. You praise him, and when you praise him, you'll begin to realize he is with you. And when he's with you, everybody will sense that, and everybody will know that. People will want to stay with you even if you're in prison. The truth is, for a lot of Christians, people don't want to be with you even in church, Right? You know what I'm saying? And God's saying, no, I want you to be the kind of person that people would be with you even in prison. Because he is with you, right? Right? And so, so here's the thing. Jesus said to his disciples, he put them on mission. They were on mission. They weren't on a vacation. It wasn't about their comfort. It was about the mission he had sent them on. Matthew 28, verse 20, he said, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm with you. Now, guys, here we go. Tune in. Reality. You want to know the secret to living above the circumstances? When I praise God, right, will you lift your hands and will you, when I praise God, will you lift them right now? Will you just lift them? Will you do this so you'll remember? Please, so you'll remember. As you lift your hands, when I praise God, he lifts me where? Above the circumstance. Come on. When I praise God, he lifts me above the circumstance. When I praise God, he lifts me above the circumstances. Now, now put your hands down and remember this. Remember this, the next time you're in a place where you have conflict with you and somebody else you love and you feel like, oh my God, this, is, this relationship's messed up, I can't have peace, I can't have joy, would you just begin to praise God and say, God, I don't care, even though everything seems crazy right now, you're still on the, and your plans for me are, right? I am on a, right? And you are always, right? Oh God, you're with me. And even in this, you're going to use this for good. And even in this, even in this conflict, God, you're going, to, you're going to use me in a way that I can bless even the person I have conflict with. Who, who wants to be there? Anybody besides me want to be there? Do you want to be there? And listen, the next time you're in a place where you're finding yourself and you're like, you're so exhausted and you're so frustrated and it just seems like things aren't working. And you're in that spot where it's like you feel wrongly accused or you feel rejection or you feel all that junk that we get to feel when we're in those places. And it can be as simple, honest to goodness, it can be as simple as just being stuck in traffic and you're getting farther behind and you're getting angry. And all of a sudden you're losing your peace and losing your joy. What if you just stopped and said, 
I'm going to praise God. Can you do it? I'm going to praise God. Lift your hands. I'm going to praise God because if I will praise him, he will lift me where? Above the circumstances, above the traffic, above the job I just lost, above whatever is going on in my life, above the false accusations, above whatever is going on. Do y'all get that? Because he's going to remind me in that moment that he's on the, and his plans for me are, right? And I'm on a, right? And he is always, and so if he does that, guys, then all of a sudden it's like in the midst of this, while I'm standing in line in the, the line at Walmart, they only have one register open. There are 27 registers, and there are 800 people in line, and I'm frustrated, right? You know what I'm saying? And things are just going crazy. If I, don't, if I forget, if I forget that he's on the throne, his plans are good, that I'm on a mission and he's always with me, I can turn that into a moment where he is disgraced. And I have no joy and I have no peace. But if I remember that he's on the throne and his plans for me are good, that I'm on a mission and he's always with me, that might be a moment in which somebody finds Jesus just because we stood beside each other in line for 10 minutes. Do y'all get that picture? Do you get that picture? Because if you and I will just do this, we will see that in every circumstance. How about in your suffering? If you're suffering physically, understand Jesus suffered physically. Understand Paul and Silas suffered physically. And if you're in the midst of suffering, I promise you, if you forget that he's on the throne and that his plans for you are good, you can just go into misery, right? If you forget that you're on a mission and he's always with you and he will use even what you're going through, oh, man, you lose it. But if you remember that, if you praise him, can we praise him? Can you put your hands up? If you praise him, he will lift you where? Above the circumstances. And he'll remind you what? That he is on the? And his plans for you are? And that you're on a? And that he is always? Right? He is. And suddenly whatever I'm going through, it's like, oh, God, you're with me, right? And you're moving. So tune in, guys. Everybody here, you've learned the secret. You've learned the secret of living above the circumstances. And the secret of living above the circumstances is really, really powerfully profound and simple. When I praise him, will you all put your hands up? Can we just, can we let this just be a, I'll never forget this, God? When I praise you, can you just picture him grabbing hold of those hands of yours and just lifting you? When I praise him, he lifts me Where? Above the circumstances. You know what he reminds me of? That he's on the, right? God, you're on the throne. You're on the throne. And his plans for us are, and we're on a, right? And he's always got every reason to rejoice, right? Every reason to have peace. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Would you allow us during this time to be profoundly impacted by these truths. And God, may they allow us, enable us to live above the circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want you to think about this, guys. Look, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was getting ready to go be beaten, scourged, nailed to a cross, bleed and die. I want you to think about what Jesus went through. And I want you to think what it would have been like if Jesus had doubted for a moment that his father was on the throne. It would have been, i got to get out of here, right? I'm not going to do this. If he doubted for a minute that the plans of his father for him were good, it would have been like, no way, I can't go into this. I can't go through this. But he knew that his father was on the throne and that his plans for him were good. Does that make sense? And if Jesus had, had forgotten the fact that he was on a mission, if he had thought, well, I thought the reason the Father sent me down here to earth was so that I could just have a really, really good time because I'm a good person. But instead he realized, no, I was, I'm here on a mission. And so this makes sense because I'm on a mission. And if he had doubted for a moment that his Father was with him, it's what he actually spoke out when he was on the cross, you remember? When he was on the cross for that moment when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the most horrible place to ever be. And within moments, you know what he ended up saying? Oh, into your hands I commit my spirit. You, you're with me. God, you're with me. You're with me. You're with me. Lord God, we pray that you would let this be for us the body of your son and let this cup be the blood that was shed for us. Let it just remind us of what Jesus did for us, God. Would you... And for those who might come and take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup, God, would you, would you remind us of what your son never forgot? <laughs> 
But you remind us of what your son never forgot. Let us never forget that you are on the throne. Let us never forget that your plans are good. Let us never forget that we are on a mission and that you are always with us. So, brothers and sisters, this is your time to respond. And if you'd like to receive communion, I love the way y'all did it last week. You just waited for an opportunity and people didn't just pack up. But if you'd like to receive communion, you can go down by the side aisles, take a piece of the bread, dip it into the cup. It's open to anybody here who truly in your heart repents of your sin and wants to live your life as a follower of Jesus, walking in his will. Um, the altar is also open to just come straight up here and kneel and pray, or you can do whatever it is that the Lord would lead you to do. But can, can we do this? Can we spend a moment in his presence? Y'all remember those jailers? I mean, those uh, prisoners just stayed right there. Wouldn't y'all like to get to the end of this day and people just be like, don't want to leave? Don't want to leave. Oh, God, I don't want to leave. You're here. He's here. He's here. God, you're here. You're with us. You're here. We don't want to leave. We just want to spend some time with you, God. We invite you to spend some time with him.